Welcome back, everybody. This is Act Two of Hamlet. Grab your books and let's start in. At the beginning of Act Two, we are back with uh, Polonius. Remember, Polonius is um, kind of like the prime minister <clears throat> uh, under Claudius. And he's talking to a servant, Rinaldo. He says, give him this money in these notes, Rinaldo. And he gives him some money and some papers. I will, my lord. You shall do marvelous wisely, good Rinaldo, before you visit him to make inquire of his behavior. My lord, I did intend it. Okay, so who do we know that Polonius knows that's recently gone somewhere? His son Laertes. Laertes has gone back to school, <clears throat> and Polonius is sending someone to check up on him. Polonius says, Mary, well said, very well said. Look you, sir, inquire me first what danskers are in Paris and how and who, what means and where they keep, what company, at what expense, and finding by this encompassment and drift of question that they do know my son, come you more nearer than your particular demands will touch it. Take you as twere some distant knowledge of him, as thus, I know his father and his friends and in part him. Do you mark this, Rinaldo? Aye, very well, my lord. Polonius is telling him, go to France, ask around if there's any Danes, do you, you know, strike up a conversation with someone in, a, in an inn. Say, oh, are there any people from Denmark here? Are, um, you know, uh, I know a guy named Laird. He's kind of, you know, I know his dad. And, Make it like you don't really know him very well and try to get the guy to talk. He said, do you mark this, Rinaldo? Aye, very well, my lord. And in part him, but, you may say, not well. But if it be he I mean, he's very wild, addicted to so-and-so, and there put on him what forgeries you please. Mary, none so rank as may dishonor him, take heed of that. But, sir, such wanton, wild, and usual slips, as our companions noted and most known to youth and liberty. As gaming, my lord? Aye, or drinking, fencing, swearing, quarreling, drabbing. You may go that far. Drabbing is hanging out with prostitutes. So he says, you know, say, oh, I kind of, I kind of know this Laertes uh, distantly, and I've, I've heard he's kind of a wild sort. I, I've heard he, he gets, uh, gets up to all sorts of shenanigans. He doesn't really, but Polonius wants to find out if he does. And so he says, if you kind of drop hints, you know, and, and lead him on to say, oh, that Laertes, he's kind of a wild one. Maybe you can get the guy to admit to something he's heard about Laertes. Reynaldo says, my lord, that would dishonor him. Faith, no, as you may season it in the charge. You must not put another scandal on him that he is open to incontinency. That's not my meaning, but breathe his faults so quaintly that they may seem the taints of liberty, the flash and outbreak of a fiery mind, a savageness in unreclaimed blood of general assault. You know, don't, don't make it sound like he's terrible. Just make it sound like he's young and a little bit wild. But my good Lord, <laughs> wherefore should you do this? I, my Lord, I would know that. Mary, sir, here's my drift, and I believe it is a fetch of wit. You laying these slight sullies on my son, as twere a thing a little soiled in the working, mark you, your party in converse, him you would sound, having ever seen in the predominant crimes the youth you breathe of guilty, be assured he closes with you in this consequence. Good sir, or so, or friend, or gentleman, according to the phrase or the addition of man and country. Polonius is starting to say, see, he's explained to Rinaldo, see, when you do this, the guy will spill information for you, if there's any information to be spilled. Uh, Rinaldo says, very good, my lord. And then, sir, does this, uh, does, what was I about to say? By the mass, I was about to say something. Where did I leave? Polonius can't even keep his train of thought. Rinaldo, at closes in the consequence. Ah, at closes in the consequence. Ah, Mary. He closes thus. I know the gentleman. I saw him yesterday, or the other day, or then, or then, with such or such, and as you say, there was a gaming, there or took in his rows, there falling out at tennis, or perchance I saw him enter such a house of sale. 
muddy licket, a brothel, or so forth. So forth. See you now. Your bait of falsehood takes this carp of truth. And thus do we of wisdom and of reach, with windlasses and with assays of bias, by indirections find directions out. So by my former lecture and advice shall you, my son. You have me, have you not? My lord, I have. God by you, fare you well. Good, my lord. Observe his inclination in yourself. I shall, my lord, and let him ply his music. Well, my lord, farewell. I want you to question people. I want you to observe him, but, you know, don't rain on his parade. Let him have a good time, but I want to find out how he's behaving. Rinaldo leaves, and Polonius's daughter, Ophelia, comes in. Remember, in Act 1, Ophelia said, um, Ophelia and Laertes discussed the fact that Hamlet has been expressing um, romantic interest in her, and Laertes warned her not to take it too seriously, and then Polonius flat out said, that's never going to happen, and stop having private conversations with Hamlet. So in comes Ophelia. How now, Ophelia, what's the matter? Oh, my Lord, my Lord, I've been so affrighted. With what in the name of God? My Lord, as I was sewing in my closet, Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all unbraced, no hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, ungartered, and down jived to his ankle, pale as his shirt, his knees knocking each other, and with a look so piteous in purport, as if he had been loosed out of hell to speak of horrors. He comes before me. Hamlet has wandered into her room, his, his hair and his person, his clothing all in disarray, looking, well, like a madman. Do you remember in the end of Act 1, Hamlet told, um, Hamlet told his friends, uh, you know, I may see fit to put an antic disposition on. Don't say anything about it. Don't worry. Polonius, though, thinks he knows. M mad for thy love? My lord, I do not know, but truly I do fear it. What said he? He took me by the wrist and held me hard. Then he goes to the length of all his arm, and with his other hand thus o'er his brow, he fail falls to such perusal of my face as he would draw it. Long stayed he so. At last, a little shaking of mine arm, and thrice his head thus waving up and down, he raised a sigh so piteous and profound as it did seem to shatter all his bulk and end his being. That done, he lets me go, and with his head over his shoulder turned, he seemed to find his way without his eyes, for out of doors he went without their helps, and to the last bended their light on me. Come, go with me. I will go seek the king. This is the very ecstasy of love, whose violent property foredoes itself, and leads the will to desperate undertakings, as oft as any passion under heaven that does afflict our natures. I am sorry. What, have you given him any hard words of late? No, my good lord, but as you did command, I did repel his letters and denied his access to me. That hath made him mad. I am sorry that with better heed and judgment I had not quoted him. I feared he did but trifle, and meant to rack thee, but beshrew my jealousy. By heaven, it is as proper to our age to cast beyond ourselves and our opinions, as it is common for the younger sort to lack discretion. You know, old men, it's as common for us to go too far in what we think is going on, as it is for young men to not show wisdom and prudence. Come, go we to the king. This must be known, which being kept close, might move more grief to hide than hate to utter, utter love. Come. It will be better it will be better to risk being hated and speak in love what we know than it is to hide it and cause more grief. Okay, that is the end of scene one. In scene two, <clears throat> we are still in the castle, but we are in the throne room with the king and queen and two uh, newcomers, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. The king says, Welcome, dear Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Moreover, that we much did long to see you, the need we have to use you did provoke our hasty sending. Something have you heard of Hamlet's transformation, so call it, since neither the exterior nor the inward man resembles that it was. What it should be, more than his father's death, that, hath, that thus hath put him so much from the understanding of himself, I cannot dream of. 
I entreat you both that, being of so young days brought up with him, and since so neighbored to his youth and havior, that you vouchsafe your rest here in our court some little time, so by your companies to draw him on to pleasures, and to gather so much as from occasion you may glean, whether aught to us unknown afflicts him thus, that opened lies within our remedy. Claudius says, It is to use you that has provoked our hasty sending. Claudius has sent for these guys. Why? Because they are childhood friends of Hamlet's. And he wants them to <clears throat> find out if there's anything going on with Hamlet that's causing his odd behavior that we might be able to do something about. He wants Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to pump Hamlet for information, to spy on him. The queen adds, Good gentlemen, he hath much talked of you, and sure I am to men there is not living to whom he more adheres. If it will please you to show us so much gentry and good will as to expend your time with us a while, for the supply and profit of our hope, your visitation shall receive such thanks as fits a king's remembrance. Both your majesties might, by the sovereign power you have of us, put your dread pleasures more into command than to entreaty. But we both obey, and here give up ourselves in the full bent to lay our service freely at your feet to be commanded. You know, you could order us because you are the king and queen, but you're not, and we appreciate your being so kind about it. We freely will obey you. Thanks, Rosencrantz and gentle Guildenstern. Thanks, Guildenstern and gentle Rosencrantz, and I beseech you instantly to visit my too much changed son. Go, some of you, and bring these gentlemen where Hamlet is. Heavens make our presence and our practice as pleasant and helpful to him. Aye, amen. And the attendants lead the two men out to find Hamlet. And Polonius comes in. Remember, Polonius thinks he has the reason figured out why Hamlet is behaving so oddly. <clears throat> the ambassadors from Norway, my good lord, are joyfully returned. Thou still hast been the father of good news. Have I, my lord? I sure, my good liege, I hold my duty as I hold my soul, both to my God and to my gracious king. And I do think, or else this brain of mine hunts not the trail of policy so sure as it hath used to do, that I have found the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. Oh, speak of that, that do I long to hear. Give first admittance to the ambassadors. My news shall be the fruit to that great feast. Thyself do grace to them, and bring them in. Remember, they sent ambassadors to Fortinbras of Norway's uncle to tell him, you know, your nephew is stirring up trouble. He's um, raising an army to come attack us and take back the land we rightfully won. You need to put a stop to this. And the ambassadors have come back to find out what they, what um, uh, Fortinbras's uncle had to say. He tells me, my dear, dear Gertrude, he tells me, my dear Gertrude, he hath found the head and source of all your son's distemper. I doubt it is no other but the main, his father's death, and our or hasty marriage. In come the ambassadors. Well, we shall sift him. Welcome, my good friends. Say, Voltaman, what is what from our brother Norway? Most fair return of greetings and desires. Upon our first he sent out to suppress his nephew's levies which to him appeared to be a preparation against the Polack. But better looked into, he truly found it was against your highness. Whereat grieved that so his sickness, age, and impotence was falsely borne in hand, sends out arrests on Fortinbras, which he, in brief, obeys, receives rebuke from Norway, and in fine makes vow before his uncle, never more to give the assay of arms against your majesty. Whereon old Norway, overcome with joy, gives him three score thousand crowns in annual fee, and his commission to employ those soldiers, so levied as before, against the Polak, with an entreaty herein further shown, that it might please you to give quiet pass through your dominions for this enterprise, of such regards of safety and allowance, as therein are set down. Uh, his uncle told him, stop it, if you stop it, I will give you money and I will finance an actual expedition against Poland, if you want. We've already got the soldiers. And let's ask King Claudius of Denmark if your army can pass freely through his lands 
on the way to Poland. It likes us well, says the king, and at our more considered time we'll read, answer, and think upon this business. Meantime, we thank you for your well-took labor. Go to your rest. At night we'll feast together. Most welcome home. And the ambassadors leave. Polonius says, this business is well ended. My liege, madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night, night, and time is time, were nothing but to waste night, day, and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit, and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. Polonius just spent about six lines telling us, I'll make it short. Your noble son is mad. Mad call I it. For to define true madness, what is it but to be nothing else but mad? But let that go. The queen is getting a little impatient. She wants him to cut to the chase. More matter with less art. Madam, I swear I use no art at all. That he is mad, tis true. Tis true, tis pity. And pity, tis tis true. A foolish figure, but farewell it, for I will use no art. Mad, let us grant him. Then, and now remains that we find out the cause of this effect, or rather say the cause of this defect, for this effect defective comes by cause. Thus it remains, and the remainder thus. He said nothing that they don't already know so far. Perpend. I have a daughter, have while she is mine, who in her duty and obedience, Mark, hath given me this. And he shows him a letter. Now, gather and surmise. Now he's reading. To the celestial and my soul's idol, the most beautified Ophelia. That's a mill phrase, a vile phrase. Beautified is a vile phrase, but you shall hear thus. In her excellent white bosom, these, etc., etc. And the letter goes on. Came this from Hamlet to her? Good madam, stay a while. I will be faithful. He reads again. Doubt thou the stars are fire, doubt that the sun doth move, doubt truth to be a liar, but never doubt I love. O oh, dear Ophelia, I am ill at these numbers. I have not art to reckon my groans. I'm not, good, I'm not a good poet. But that I love thee best, O oh, most best, believe it, adieu. Thine evermore, most dear lady, whilst this machine is to him, Hamlet. That's the end of the letter. This in obedience hath my daughter shown me, and more above hath his solicitings, as they fell out by time, by means, and place, all given to mine ear. My daughter's told me everything. But how has she received his love? What do you think of me? As of a man faithful and honorable. I would fain prove so, but what might you think when I had seen this hot love on the wing? as I perceived it, I must tell you that, before my daughter told me. What might you, or my dear majesty, your queen here, think, if I had played the desk or table book, or given my heart a winking, mute and dumb, or looked upon this love with idle sight? What might you think? What, what might your opinion be of me if I knew this was going on and I didn't act? No, I went round to work, and my young mistress thus I did to speak, I did bespeak. Lord Hamlet is a prince, out of thy star, this must not be. And then I prescripts gave her that she should lock herself from his resort, admit no messengers, receive no tokens, which done, she took the fruits of my advice, and he, repelled, a short tale to make, fell into a sadness, then into a fast, thence to a watch, thence into a weakness, thence to a lightness, and then by this declension into the madness wherein now he raves, and all we mourn for. Do you think this? It may be very like. Hath there been such a time, I would fain know that, that I have positively said this tis so, when tis proved otherwise? Polonius says, have I ever been wrong? The king says, not that I know. Then take this from this, if this be otherwise. If circumstances lead me, I will find where truth is hid, though it were hid indeed within the center. I'm going to get to the bottom of this, says Polonius. How may we try it further? 
Polonius already has a plan. Remember, this is the guy who just sent a spy to France to, to spy on his son. You know, sometimes he walks for four hours together here in the lobby. So he does indeed. At such a time, I'll loose my daughter to him. Be you and I be, and behind an arras there. Mark the encounter. You and I, King, are going to hide behind a curtain. I'll sick my daughter on him and get him talking, and we'll, see, we'll hear the whole thing. If he love her not, and be not from his reason fallen there, thereon, let me be no assistant for a state, but keep a farm and carters. We will try it. And right then, here comes Hamlet, reading a book. Oh, but look where sadly the poor wretch comes reading. Away, I do beseech you, both away. I'll board him presently. Polonius says, leave, leave. I'm going to have a talk with him right now. I'm going to pump him for information right now. Oh, give me leave. How does my good lord Hamlet? Well, God of mercy. Do you know me, lord? Excellent well. You are a fishmonger. <laughs> Not I, my lord. Then I would you were so honest a man. Honest, my lord? Aye, sir, to be honest as this world goes is to be one man picked out of ten thousand. That's very true, my lord. For if the sun breed maggots in a dead dog, being a good kissing carrion, have you a daughter? I have, my lord. Let her not walk in the sun. Conception is a blessing, but as your daughter may conceive, friend, look to it. How say you by that? Still harping on my daughter. Yet he knew me not at first, that I was a fishmonger. Ah, uh, it's far gone. And truly in my youth I suffered much extremity for love, very near this. I'll speak to him again. Remember, whenever it says aside, Polonius is not talking to Hamlet. He's kind of muttering under his breath. He's telling us, basically. What do you read, my lord? Words, words, words. What is the matter, my lord? Between who? I mean the matter that you read, my lord. Slanders, sir, for the satirical rogue says here that old men have gray beards, that their faces are wrinkled, their eyes purging thick amber and plum tree gum, and that they have a plentiful lack of wit together with most weak hams. All which, sir, though I most powerfully and potently believe, yet I hold it not honesty to have it thus set down. He just insulted old men. I don't think the book said that at all. I think Hamlet made it up because he's talking to an old man. For you yourself, sir, shall grow old as I am, if like a crab you could go backward. Polonius, again, aside. Though this be madness, yet there is method in it. Will you walk out of the air, my lord? Into my grave? Indeed, that's out of the air. How pregnant sometimes his replies are. A happiness that often madness hits on, which reason and sanity could not so pro prosperously be delivered of. I will leave him and suddenly contrive the means of meeting between him and my daughter. He says, sometimes crazy people say really meaningful things. He seems to say things that aren't unreasonable or are very, very meaningful and deep. I don't know if he means it or not, but I'm going to go, I'm going to leave now and set up a chance to sick my daughter on him. My honorable Lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you. You cannot, sir, take from me anything that I would more willingly part with all, except my life, except my life except my life. Fare you well, my lord. And as Polonius walks away, he mutters under his breath, these tedious old fools. In the meantime, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are approaching, and they encounter Polonius, who says, you go to seek the Lord Hamlet? There he is. God save you, sir, he says to Polonius, and Polonius leaves. Guildenstern, my honored lord, my most dear lord, my excellent good friends, how dost thou, Guildenstern? Ah, oh, Rosencrantz, good lads, how do you both? As the indifferent children of the earth, happy in that we are not over happy. On fortune's cap, we are not the very button, nor the soles of her shoe, neither, my lord. Then you live about her waist in the middle of her favors? Faith, her 
privates we. Ah, and the secret parts of fortune? Oh, most true. She is a strumpet. What news? None, my lord, but the world's grown honest. Then is doomsday near. But your news is not true. Let me question more in particular. What have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? Why are you here? Why has fortune sent you here to the place that he calls a prison? Prison, my lord? Denmark's a prison. <laughs> then is the world one? A goodly one, in which there are many confines, wards, and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. We think not so, my lord. Why then, tis none to you. For there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. Why then, your ambition makes it one. Tis too narrow for your mind. You're too great a man, Hamlet. That's why it feels like a prison. You need bigger spaces, bigger scope for your abilities. Oh God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space, were it not that I have bad dreams. Which dreams indeed are ambition, for the very substance of the ambitious is merely the shadow of a dream. Hamlet says a dream itself is but a shadow. Truly, and I hold ambition of so airy and light a quality that, quality that it is but a shadow shadow. Then are our beggars bodies and our monarchs and outstretched heroes the beggars shadows. If um, ambition is just a uh, shadow or a shadow shadow, then beggars are solid in this, in this view of the world because uh, they're not ambitious. Shall we to court? For by my fay, I cannot reason. They say, we'll wait upon you. No such matter. I will not sort you with the rest of my servants, for to speak to you like an honest man, I am most dreadfully attended. But in the beaten way of friendship, what make you at Elsinore? He's asking them again, why are you here? To visit you, my lord, no other occasion. Beggar that I am, I am even poor in thanks. But I thank you, and sure, my dear friends, my thanks are too dear a halfpenny. Were you not sent for? Is it your own inclining? Is it a free visitation? Come, come, deal justly with me. Come, come, nay, speak. Hamlet knows what's going on. He's not stupid and he's not crazy. And he knows this is a setup. His friends just showed up out of the blue. He knows the king and queen have sent them to spy on him. What should we say, my lord? Why, anything but to the purpose you were sent for. And there is a kind of confession in your looks which your modesties have not craft enough to color. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. To what end, my lord? That you must, must teach me. But let me conjure you by the rights of our fellowship, by the constancy of our youth, by the obligation of our ever-preserved love, and by what more dear a better prosperer could charge you with all, be even and direct with me, whether you were sent for or no. And they start talking to each other. What, what say you? Nay, then, I have eye of you. If you love me, hold not off. My lord, we were sent for. I will tell you why. So shall my anticipation prevent your discovery, and your secrecy to the king and queen molt no feather. You promised them not to tell that they sent for you to find out what's wrong with me. I will tell you why they sent for you, and then you won't have to feel that you uh, didn't keep your promise. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, foregone all custom of exercises, and indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition, that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave o'erhanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, why, it appeareth nothing to me but a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is a man! 
How noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? What is a man to me? Man delights not me. No, nor woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. My Lord, there was no such stuff in my thoughts. Why did you laugh then when I said, man delights not me? To think, my Lord, if you delight not in man, what Linton entertainment the players shall receive from you. We coated them on the way, and hither they are coming to offer you service. There's a group of players, a, a theatrical troupe, a traveling theatrical troupe, on their way to Elsinore to entertain the court. Hamlet likes this news. He that plays the king shall be welcome. His majesty shall have tribute of me. The adventurous knight shall use his foil and target. The lover shall not sigh gratis. The humorous man shall end his part in peace. The clown shall make those laugh whose lungs are tickle of the seer. And the lady shall say her mind freely, or the blank verse shall halt for it. These are all the characters in the play. All the characters in the play will say their piece and play their part. What players are they? Even those you were wont to take such delight in, the tragedians of the city. How chances that they travel? Their residence, both in reputation and profit, was better both ways. What, what are they doing traveling around? They used to have their own uh, theater in town, and people went to see them there. I think their inhibition comes by the means of the late innovation. Do they hold the same estimation they did when I was in the city? Are they so followed? No, indeed, they are not. How comes it? Do they grow rusty? They're, they're not as popular in town anymore, and Hamlet wants to know why. Are they getting bad? Nay, their endeavor keeps in the wanted pace. But there is, sir, an area of children, little Iases, that cry out on the top of question and are most tyrannically clapped for it. These are now the fashion, and so be rattle the common stages, so they call them, that many wearing rapiers are afraid of goose quills and dare scarce come thither. Um, there's a new fashion in town, children's troops. Troops composed entirely of children, and everybody goes and claps for them. And the better sort are afraid even to go see um, theatrical troops like the one that's on its way to the castle, um, because they're afraid it'll make them look bad. They'll be out of fashion. What, are they children? Who maintains them? How are they escorted? Will they pursue the quality no longer than they can sing? Will they not say afterwards, if they should grow themselves to common players, as it is most like, if their means are no better, their writers do them wrong to make them exclaim against their own succession? Don't these kids know they're going to grow up? And then they're going to be out of fashion if they put the adult players out of fashion? Faith, there has been much to do on both sides, and the nation holds it no sin to tar them to controversy. There was for a while no money bid for argument unless the poet and the player went to cuffs in the question. It's possible? Oh, there's been much throwing about of brains. Oh, it's, it's the talk of the town. Everybody's arguing about this. Do the boys carry it away? Aye, that they do, my lord. Hercules and his load, too. It is not very strange. For my uncle is king of Denmark, and those that would make mouths at him while my father lived... Give twenty, forty, fifty, a hundred ducats apiece for his picture in little. Uh, it's not strange to me that the players that are on the way, who are good players, are being scooched out by these children. My father was a great king, and he's been bumped out of the way by my uncle. People that used to make fun of my uncle when my father was alive. Now they'll pay good money to have a little miniature portrait of him. Splud, there is something more, there's something in this more than natural, if philosophy could find it out. Oh, and they hear trumpets. Oh, there are the players. Hamlet says, gentlemen, you are welcome to Elsinore. Your hands, come then. The appurtenance of welcome is fashion and ceremony. Let me comply with you in this garb, lest my extent to the players, which I tell you must show fairly outwards, should more appear like entertainment than yours. I want to greet you fair and square. 
because I'm going to go greet the players and I want your greeting to look just as courteous as the one I'm about to give them. You are welcome, but my uncle father and aunt mother are deceived. In what, my dear lord? I am but mad north-northwest. When the wind is southerly, I know a hawk from a handsaw. Polonius comes in. He's going to tell them the players are there, but they already know. Well be with you, gentlemen. Hark you, Guildenstern, and you too. At each ear a hearer. That great baby you see there is not yet out of his swaddling claws. He's talking about Polonius. Happily he is the second time come to them, for they say an old man is twice a child. I will prophesy he comes to tell me of the players. Mark it. Now he's going to act like they were talking about something else. Oh, you say right, sir, a Monday morning. T'was then indeed. Polonius says, my lord, I have news to tell you. My lord, I have news to tell you. When Roscus was an actor in Rome, the actors are come hither, my lord. Buzz, buzz. Upon my honor. Then came each actor on his ass. The best actors in the world, either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral comical, historical pastoral, tragical historical, tragical comical, historical pastoral, scene individable or individable, or poem unlimited. Seneca cannot be too heavy, nor Plautus too light. For the law of writ and the liberty, these are the only men. Polonius just goes on and on, doesn't he? O oh, Jeff, the judge of Israel, what a treasure hadst thou! What a treasure had he, my lord? Why, one fair daughter and no more, the which he loved passing well. Polonius says, still on my daughter. Am I not in the right, old Jephthah? If you call me Jephthah, my lord, I have a daughter that I love passing well. Nay, that follows not. What follows then, my lord? Why, as by lot, God wot. And then, you know, it came to pass, as most like it was. The first row of the pious chans chanson will show you more, for look where my abridgment comes. He's quoting a play about Jephthah, and obviously because Jephthah had a daughter, Polonius is thinking he's talking about Ophelia, and then he says, oh, here comes my abridgment. I would go on with this conversation, but the players are coming and they're going to interrupt. Enter the players, and Hamlet continues, You are welcome, masters, welcome. Welcome all. I am glad to see thee well. Welcome, good friends. Oh, old friend, why, thy face is balanced since I lost, saw thee last. Comest thou to beard me in Denmark? <laughs> what, my young lady and mistress? By your lady, your ladyship is nearer to heaven than when I saw you last by the altitude of a Chopine. Um, in Shakespearean times, women were not on stage. Women were played by boys. And so he's saying, when he says, your ladyship, it's the boy that plays the women's parts, and he's grown. He says, he's nearer to heaven. He's taller. Pray God your voice, like a piece of uncurrent gold, be not cracked within the ring. Masters, you are all welcome. We'll e'en to it like French falconers. Fly at anything we see. We'll have a speech straight. Come, give us a taste of your quality. Come, a passionate speech. What speech, my good lord? I heard thee speak me a speech once, but it was never acted, or if it was, not above once. For the play, I remember, please not the million, which was caviar -y to the general. You, I heard you do a play once. I heard you give a speech. Nobody ever really went to this play. It was um, too highbrow. The common people didn't love that sort of thing. But it was, as I received it, and others, whose judgment in such matters cried in the top of mine. An excellent play, well digested in the scenes, set down with as much modesty as cunning. I remember one said there were no salads in the lines to make the matter savory, nor no matter in the phrase that might indict the author of affectation, but called it an honest method, as wholesome as sweet, and by very much more handsome than fine. In other words, everybody, everybody whose opinion was good said this play was great. One speech in it I chiefly loved. It was Aeneas's tale to Dido, and thereabout of it, especially when he speaks of Priam's slaughter. If it live in your memory, begin at this line. Let me see, let me see. 
the rugged Pyrrhus, like the Hyrcanian beast, no, tis not so. It begins with Pyrrhus. The rugged Pyrrhus, he whose sable arms, black as his purpose, did the night resemble when he lay couched in the ominous horse, hath now this dread and black complexion smeared with heraldry more dismal. Head to foot now is he total jewels, horribly tricked with blood of fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, baked and impasted with the parching streets that lend a tyrannous and a damned light to their lord's murder. Roasted in wrath and fire, and thus o'ersized with coagulate gore, with eyes like carbuncles, the hellish Pyrrhus, old grandsire Priam seeks. So proceed you. So, in other words, he wants the player to say the speech, but Hamlet's just given the beginning of it. He's like, oh, start there, start there. That's the speech I want. Start from there, where I left off. Polonius says, For God, my lord, well spoken, with good accent and good discretion. He says, Hamlet, you're quite an actor. You're quite an actor. All right, the first player picks it up there. Anon he finds him striking too short at Greeks. His antique sword, rebellious to his arm, lies where it falls, repugnant to command. Unequal matched, Pyrrhus at Priam drives, in rage strikes wide, but with the whiff and wind of his fell sword, the unnerved father falls. Then senseless Ilium, seeming to feel this blow, with flaming top stoops to his base, and with a hideous crash takes prisoner Pyrrhus's ear. For lo, his sword, which was declining on the milky head of reverend Priam, seemed in the air to stick. So as a painted tyrant Pyrrhus stood, and like a neutral to his will and matter, did nothing. But as we often see against some storm, a silence in the heavens, the rack stand still, the bold wind speechless, and the oar bellow as hush as death, anon the dreadful thunder doth rend the region. So, after Pyrrhus's pause, a roused vengeance sets him new a work, and never did the Cyclops' hammers fall on Mars's armor forged for proof eterne with less remorse than Pyrrhus's bleeding sword now falls on Priam. Out, out, thou strumpet fortune! All you gods in general synod, take away her power. Break all the spokes and fellies from her wheel, and bowl the round knave down the hill of heaven, as low as to the fiends. This is the scene where Pyrrhus is about to kill Priam, king of Troy. Pyrrhus is Achilles' son. Um, he kills him right uh, in front of the altar, and he tells this long story about how for a moment Pyrrhus pauses and then he strikes. But obviously this is a fairly long speech. Polonius interrupts, this is too long. Hamlet says, it shall to the barber with your beard. Prithee, I say on. He's for a jig or a tale of baudry, or he sleeps. Polonius is no judge of theater. Say on, come to Hecuba. But woe, ah, woe, had seen the mobbled queen. Oh, the mobbled queen? Polonius says, that's good. Mobbled queen is good. Run barefoot up and down, threatening the flames with bis and room, a clout upon that head where late the diadem stood, and for a robe about her lank and all or timid loins, a blanket, in the alarm of fear caught up. Who this had seen with tongue in venom steeped, gainst fortune's state would treason have pronounced. But if the gods themselves did see her then, when she saw Pyrrhus make malicious sport in mincing with his sword her husband's limbs, the instant burst of clamor that she made, unless things mortal move them not at all, would have made milch the burning eyes of heaven and passion in the gods. The speech goes on to say, oh, if you had seen Hecuba, his wife, how she was weeping, how she was moaning as Pyrrhus killed her husband. And as the player speaks, he's acting it out. He's crying. Polonius says, oh, look where he hath, has not his color. I'm sorry. Look where he has not turned his color and his tears in his eyes. Prithee, no more. Tis well. I'll have thee speak out the rest of this soon. He's not really upset. You know, the player is just an actor. He's acting out the scene of the deaths of Hecuba and Priam. Good my lord, will you see the players well bestowed? He's talking to Polonius. Do you hear? Let them be well used. 
for they are the abstract and brief chronicles of the time. Theatrical troops are like the editorial page. They tell you what's important to people. They tell us what matters. They are the abstract and brief chronicles of the time. And of course, this line is being spoken in a play being performed by a troop of players. After your death, Polonius, you were better have a bad epitaph than their ill report while you live. You better not get on their bad side because the theatrical troops will rip you up one side and down the other in public. My lord, I will use them according to their desert. God's bodkin man much better. Use every man after his desert? And who shall scape whipping? Use them after your own honor and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. Take them in. Come, sirs. Follow him, friends. We'll hear a play tomorrow. And as they leave, Hamlet detains the first player, the guy who just made the speech. He holds him back. And he says, Dost thou hear me, old friend? Can you play the murder of Gonzago? Hi, my lord. We'll have it tomorrow night. You could, for need, study a speech of some dozen or sixteen lines, which I would set down and insert in it. Could you not? I, my lord. Look, hey, hey, I want you to perform this play called The Murder of Gonzago. The guy says, sure. He says, okay. I want to write a little speech to stick in the middle. <clears throat> Can you memorize that speech, too, and do it in the middle? I, my lord. Very well. Follow that lord, and look you mock him not. My good friends, I'll leave you till night. You are welcome to Elsinore. Um, Polonius and the players exit. Rosencrantz says, good, my lord. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern exit. And once again, Hamlet is alone. Aye, so, God by you. Now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all his visage wand, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit? The player just now, he changed his whole appearance. He wept. He went pale, thinking about Priam and Hecuba. And all for nothing. For Hecuba! What's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba that he should weep for her? What would he do had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. This guy just broke down over a fictional, probably, character. My dad has been murdered. What if he had a reason to be upset like I have? What would he do on the stage? Yet I, a dull and muddy-metaled rascal, peak like John in dreams, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing. No, not for a king upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain, breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie in the throat its deepest to the lungs? Who does me this? Ah, swoons. I should take it. For it cannot be but I am pigeon-livered, and lack gall to make oppression bitter. Or ere this I should have fatted all the region kites with this slave's offal. You know, I'll, I'll take any insults, apparently. You can pluck off my beard, tweak me by the nose. Apparently I just take it. Because somebody murdered my father, I haven't done anything about it yet. If I had a backbone... I would already be feeding the neighborhood vultures with my uncle's insides. I would have fatted all the region kites with this slave's offal. Bloody body villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain. Oh, vengeance. Why, what an ass am I? 
This is most brave, that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must like a whore unpack my heart with words and fall a-cursing like a very drab. Oh, I'm super brave. I'm just going to sit here and talk to myself. I'm going to go on and on and give speeches. That's all I'm doing about it. A spy upon it. Fuh. About my brains. Hmm. I've heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. I have heard that sometimes people have committed a crime, and then if they're at a play, and in the play something happens similar to their crime, they just confess. For murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tint him to the quick. If it do blench, I know my course. Those players are going to act out my father's murder. And my uncle's going to watch, and I'm going to watch my uncle. And if he looks upset, if he looks uncomfortable at all, I got him. I know he did it. The spirit that I have seen may be the devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. You know, I think I saw my father's ghost, but demons can take all sorts of shapes. And we know they tempt us to do bad things. What if it wasn't my father? What if my uncle didn't kill my dad? What if this is a setup and demons want me to kill my uncle to damn me? I need more proof. So I'm going to have this little play done in front of my uncle. And if he reacts in a guilty-seeming way, I got him. I'll have grounds more relative than this, than just the word of the ghost. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. All right. And that ends Act 3. I'll see you. Or uh, that ends Act 2. Sorry. I'll see you for Act 3.